Hey everybody, welcome back to chapter 13 in what, industrial, oh I'm already off to a rough start today, industrial organizational psychology uh, from the OpenStax Online 2E Psychology textbook. Uh, today we're going to continue where we left off on job satisfaction, but for a quick refresher, last time we talked about what exactly is industrial organizational psychology, what is it made up of, some famous industrial organizational psychologists, and then we briefly talked about um, evaluating employees, uh, and also discrimination, laws against discrimination in the workplace, and hiring practices and whatnot. So yeah, today we are going to start where we left off at job satisfaction. So job satisfaction results from how we think about our work, cognition, and how we feel about our work, affect. Now it is influenced by the work itself, our personality, and our culture, and measured using questionnaires that employees complete and also can be measured at a global level, so general satisfaction with work, or at the level of specific factors, so like which aspects of the job lead to satisfaction. So here we have some, looks like business people holding up kind of creepy smiley face pictures. Uh, but anyways, whatever they want to put in here. So, so factors involved in job satisfaction. Autonomy, or individual responsibility and control over decisions. Work content, so variety, challenge, and role clarity. Uh, this is most strongly predictive of overall job satisfaction. And then communication or feedback. Oh, I did not mean to do that. I'm sorry, guys. So feedback, financial rewards, such as salary and benefits. Uh, there's a weak correlation with job satisfaction, though. That's surprising. Uh, growth and development. So personal growth, training, and education. And we have promotion, career advancement opportunity, coworkers, professional relations or adequacy, supervision and feedback, support, recognition, and fairness. Workload, time pressure, and or yeah, time pressure and tedium, and finally work demand, so extra work require requirements, insecurity position. So those factors make up job satisfaction. Next, we have job stress. This is caused by specific stressors in an occupation, and it leads to poor health, job performance, and family life. Because you know, if you have a really stressful job, you're probably not going to be the most relaxed at home after you get off work. So, stressors include having to fill multiple roles, workplace role ambiguity, so you don't really know exactly what your role is in the workplace, lack of career progress, lack of job security, lack of control over work outcomes, isolation, work overload, discrimination, harassment, and bullying. So these can all lead to job stress. So, threats to job security, downsizing, which, which is a process in which an organization tries to achieve a greater overall efficiency by reducing the number of employees. So, IO psychologists may be involved in how the news is delivered and how laid off and retained employees are supported. Next, we have corporate mergers of the joining of two organizations and acquisition. One organization purchases another. This often leads to cuts due to duplication of core functions like sales and accounting at each company. And research focuses on understanding employee reactions and practical recommendations for managing organizational changes. So here you can see merged company, which is formed from company A and company B. So you have company A sales department, company A accounting department, and company B also has those departments. So when there's an acquisition or a merge, not acquisition, a merger there, uh, company A sales department might get cut or company B accounting department might get cut because they don't want to spend extra money on something that another company already has. So that's a threat to your job security because if you're in company A sales department and they decide to you know, get rid of your sales department, you don't have a job. Next, we have work-family balance. So work-family balance occurs when people juggle the demands of work life with the demands of family life. So Greenhouse and Butel in 1985, they found that three sources of work, uh, the three sources of work-family conflicts. So time devoted to work makes difficult to fill requirements of family or vice versa. Uh, strain from, from participation in work leads to difficult to fulfill requirements of family or vice versa. And finally, specific behaviors required by work leads to difficult to fulfill requirements of family or vice versa. So these three, these three things, time devoted to work makes, or time devoted to work, I don't know why this makes there, uh, strain from participation in work, and then specific behaviors required by work can affect your family life. And next we have ways to decrease work-family conflict, so support in the home, whether it's emotional or practical. Uh, practical support found to be the most effective, however, then there's workplace support, so understanding supervisors, flex time, leave with pay, and telecommunicating. 
Now, telecommunicating is an employee's ability to set their own hours, allowing them to work from home at different parts of the day. And uh, telecommuting was found to make the conflict worse. So that's not good because we've all been in a pandemic lockdown the past year. So management and organizational structure. Douglas McGregor in 1960 combined scientific management and human relations into the notion of leadership behavior. Uh, scientific management is a theory of management that analyzes and synthesizes workflows with the main objective of improving economic efficiency, uh, especially labor productivity. And, it, I, and he identified two different styles of managers. So there's theory X, that the manager assumes workers are inherently lazy and unproductive, so the managers must have control and use punishments. And then there's theory Y, or manager Y. Manager assumes workers are people who seek to work hard and product productively, and uh, managers, managers and workers can find creative solutions to problems. Workers do not need to be controlled and punished. So, continuing on with theory X and theory, theory Y, uh, here are the management styles. So, theory X, people dislike work and avoid it. People avoid responsibility. People want to be told what to do. They don't have their own autonomy where they do it themselves. And goals are achieved through rules and punishments. Then there's theory Y, people enjoy work and find it natural. People are most satisfied when given responsibility for you know, their own actions. People want to take part in setting their own work goals, and goals are achieved through enticements and rewards. So, continuing with management organizational structure, we have Donald Clifton, who researched how an organization can best use an individual's strengths, argued that our strengths provide the greatest opportunity for growth, and then there's strength-based management in its approach that focuses on employee strengths. Then we have Bass, it's a funny name, in uh, 1985. So transactional leadership, characteristic of leaders who focus on supervision and organizational goals achieved through a system of rewards and punishments uh, and maintenance of the organizational status quo. So transformational leadership, uh, there's charismatic role models, inspirational, so optimistic about goal attainment, intellectually stimulating, encourage critical thinking and problem solving, and individually considerate and who seek to change the organization. So those are transformational leaderships. Next, we have goals, teamwork, and work teams. So there's a team-based approach, which many companies structure their organization so that work can be delegated to work teams. Now, a work team is a group of people within an organization or company given a specific task to achieve together, brings together diverse skills, experience, and expertise, and do not always deliver greater productivity. So why do some teams work well while others do not? Uh, there's social loafing, poor communication, poor decision-making skills due to conformity effects, and there can always be conflict within the group. Uh, the team halo effect is teams are given credit for their successes, but individuals within the team are blamed for team failures. So that's, you know, when the team does good, the team's given credit, but if it does bad, then people in the group start to be blamed for it. So, continuing on, we have teams and gender diversity. So cons of this are that diversity can introduce communication and interpersonal relationship problems, but the pros are that uh, diversity can increase the team's skill set. Now, Hugendum, Oosterbeek, and Van Prague in 2013 found that gender-balanced teams performed better than predominantly male teams, uh, but did not identify which mechanism accounted for performance improvement. So there's three types of teams. Problem resolution teams, which created for the purpose of solving a particular problem. Uh, creative teams, which are used to develop innovative possibilities or solutions. And tactical teams, which are used to execute a well-defined plan or objective. So research on the virtual team examines how groups of geographically disparate people brought together using digital communications uh, technology function. So organizational culture is the values, visions, hierarchies, norms, and interactions among its employees. It is how an organization is run, how it operates, and how it makes deci decisions. I said decisions. Um, Ostroff, Knicki, and Tampkins in 2003 found three layers in an organizational culture. Uh, observable artifacts, so symbols of language, jargon, slang, and humor. Narratives, so stories and legends. And practices or rituals that represent the underlying cultural assumptions. There's espoused values, which are concepts slash beliefs that management or entire organization endorses. And then there's basic assumptions, so usually unobservable and unquestioned. Now, diversity training educates participants about cultural differences with the goal of improving teamwork, and it aims to reduce prejudice. So, going on. Next, we have, oh boy, sexual harassment. Um, 
Most organizations have developed sexual harassment policies that define harassment and procedures to prevent and address it when it occurs. Uh, sexual harassment is sexually based behavior that is knowingly unwanted and has an adverse effect on a person's employment status, interferes with a person's job performance, or creates a hostile or intimidating work environment. So there are a couple types of sexual harassment. You have quid pro quo, you give something to get something, uh, organizational rewards are offered in exchange for sexual favors. Next there is the threat of withholding a reward if a sexual request is refused. Then we have hostile environment sexual harassment. So employee experiences conditions in the workplace considered hostile or intimidating, i.e. Uh, environment allowing offensive language or sexually explicit images. So that would be no good. You don't want to walk into workplace and have something you know, degrading just sitting on the wall. Next, we have workplace violence, which is violence or the threat of violence against workers, and it can occur inside or outside the workplace. It includes physical violence, harassment, intimidation, or other disruptive behavior. It ranges from threats and verbal abuse to physical assaults and homicide. Warning signs include intimidating behavior, threats, sabotaging equipment, or radical changes in a coworker's behavior. Feelings of being treated unfairly, unjustly, or not there we go. Or disrespectfully are significant triggers. Uh, there's procedural justice, which is fairness of the processes by which outcomes are determined in conflicts with or among employees. So Greenberg and Barling in 1999 uh, found a history of aggression and amount of alcohol consumed leads to accurate predictors of violence against a coworker and feelings of being unfairly treated or untrusted lead to predictors or are predictors of aggression against a supervisor. Finally, job security and alcohol consumption are predictors of aggression against a subordinate. So all of these are predictors. You know, you don't. You, if you see these in the workplace, you better uh, brace yourself. So we're wrapping up here. So let's keep going strong. So now we have human factors psychology, which studies the integration, so physical, cognitive, or both, of the human machine interface in the workplace, and is concerned with researching and designing machines that fit human requirements and is involved in the development of regulations and principles of test design, often related to safety. Now, areas of study, so we have attention, which includes vigilance and monitoring, recognizing signals and noise, mental resources, and divided attention. So how is attention maintained? What about tasks maintains attention? And how do you design systems to support attention? It's kind of like what they're asking. So cognitive engineering includes human software interactions and complex automated systems, especially decision-making processes of workers as they are supported by the software system. So this asks, how do workers use and obtain information provided by software? Next, we have task analysis, so breaking down the elements of task. And this asks, how can a task be performed more efficiently? How can a task be performed more safely? And finally, we have cognitive task analysis, which is breaking down the elements of a cognitive task. So it asks, how are decisions made? And finally, for this chapter, we have workplace safety. So checklist used to reduce accidents in the workplace. For example, pilots are required to go through a detailed checklist of the different parts of the aircraft before takeoff to ensure that all the essential equipment is working correctly. Next, we have time limits on operating equipment. So this limits how long an operator, such as a pilot or truck driver, is allowed to operate the equipment because you don't want, you know, a pilot driving a plane around for 16 hours straight, probably going to be pretty fatigued. So yeah, guys, that is the end of chapter 13, Industrial Organizational Psychology. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. I know I personally did. I just love this kind of stuff. I find it really interesting. So I hope you guys enjoyed this chapter, and I hope that you continue into the next chapter. That should be fun, too. Um, please leave a comment if you have any questions or any tips and advice on how we can make these videos better. Um, but other than that, I hope you guys have a great day. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Synced or Sysync Psychology, and I hope to see you guys in the next video. Thank you. Bye.